Hi everyone, it's John, and welcome back to my channel. Thanks for joining me. It is August 6, 2021, and today I have a review for you. This book is special in a couple of ways, at least. One, because I really, really enjoyed it and learned a lot from it. But the more important thing is that it was a gift. It was a gift from Peg over at the History Shelf, who I've mentioned several times on this channel, and whose information I'll leave down below. If you're not already subscribed to Peg's channel, you certainly should be. If you like a lot of things that you see here, her channel is sort of a natural extension of mine in a lot of ways. We, we love a lot of the same things, especially history. And um, while it doesn't exactly say the word history on the cover, this book is, of course, steeped in it. Um, this is Conservatism, The Fight for a Tradition by Edmund Fawcett. Um, just came out uh, last year. I think uh, it has a companion volume, which I'll mention uh, in the body of the review, which came out in uh, 2018. But this book is uh, less than a year old. Peg got, uh, for whatever reason, was sent two copies by Princeton on accident and was kind enough to ask me if I wanted one of the copies, and of course I said yes. So, uh, always up to review something like this. Try to get a grasp of an entire intellectual tradition, from its historical roots to its various contemporary incarnations within the cover of a single book, is a pretty daunting job. But as it turns out, this book, Conservatism, is not the first time that Edmund Fawcett has accomplished this task, but his second. Like I said, his uh, 2018 book, Liberalism, The Life of an Idea, does largely the same thing with the liberal political tradition. Uh, but this book on conservatism came out in October of last year, 2020, and was also published by Princeton University Press. The, uh, the presentation of the ideas in the book is pretty chronological and pretty easy to follow. Uh, Fawcett begins with two introductory chapters, the first of which discusses the birth of the idea of conservatism as two distinctly different kinds of responses to the events of the French Revolution. First, the more measured, quiet skepticism of... Uh, a, the more measured, quiet skepticism towards the revolution advanced by people like Edward Edmund Burke. And then you have the sort of more stentorian, loud, aggressive, a counter-revolutionary response offered up by people like uh, Joseph de Maistre. Uh, these are then followed up by four longer chapters, which are broken up into periods. Uh, the first one, 1830 to 1880. 1880 to 1945, 1945 to 1980, and 1980 to the present. And each of these chapters begins with a sort of theoretical overview of the major themes and people that are identified with that era. And then they delve into, or he, the author, delves into near encyclopedic commentaries <laughs> on the events of that era uh, in four countries the United States, France, Germany, and England. Because of Fawcett's sort of fourfold uh, national interest that relies heavily on a detailed knowledge of 19th and 20th century European history, especially the countries of England, France, and Germany, uh, readers without this background are going to find the book a bit of a chore. American readers will recognize one hopes, one hopes, uh, their own history, but can you tell what a Bourbonist is from a Bonapartist, or how the Reform Act of 1832 was important, or the Reform Act of 1867, or the Reform Act of 1882? Um, it's not so much that these things play a large part in the book, but if you're not at least passing with familiar with the shape of British, French, and German history over, say, the last 200 plus years, roughly, then I think the appreciation that you draw from the book might be a little bit uh, limited. Uh, so what then, 
distinguishes conservatism from any other brand of political thought. Whether in the realm of economics or social matters, uh, Fawcett identifies conservatism with a few things that loosely t- sort of tie these ideas together. One of them is the inscrutability of history. A lot, a lot of liberals sort of look back on history and claim to see patterns in it, either a decline and a fall or a steady progression towards the good, usually is more associated with a, a liberal tradition. But conservatives often look back and see that um, really what we do when we look back is we're just reading things into history um, uh, after, after the case, ex post facto, instead of really understanding it as it happens. And there is no understanding it as it happens because it is, by nature, they say, inscrutable, uh, un, unable to be understood. Uh, two, the severely limited power of human reason and human is always human reason is always bounded by uh, what we know, and therefore always finite. And lastly, the imperfectibility of man. So the the denial of utopias, uh, the possibility even of human uh, human utopia. Uh, he sort of ed- uh, he sort of echoes uh, Russell Kirk's permanent things, and uh, he claims that. Most conservatives are drawn together in their respect for established institutions, custom, order, tradition, and religion, although uh, most of them are open and accommodating of gradual amounts of change over time. So in the first period, 1830 to 1880, French politics, uh, we see, are dominated by a discussion of whether or not to return to the monarchy. This is uh, post-Napoleon here. While conservative leaders in Britain, like Lord Derby and uh, Benjamin Disraeli, uh, tried to negotiate within the framework of a burgeoning liberal democracy. Uh, This is right after the the reforms of, of 1832, which I mentioned. During the second half of the 19th century, Fawcett takes up thinkers as myriad and diverse as Orestes Brownson, Charles Hodge, Felicity de Lamennais, uh, Otto von Gierke, Wilhelm von Ketteler, Cardinal Newman, James Fitzjames Stephen, and one name you might not associate with a history of conservatism, which is Samuel Taylor Coleridge. The third period, 1845 to ni- sorry, 1945 to 1980, takes up de Gaulle, Adenauer, Goldwater, Nixon, Reagan, Taft, Macmillan, Harold Macmillan, the uh, Prime Minister of England, and Thatcher, and frames uh, the conservatism of the latter part of the period as a backlash against the sort of radical counterpolitics of the 1960s. I'd tell you Fawcett's opinion of American conservatism post-1980, but I just wanted to get through one review without having to think about or explain the Laffer Curve or Donald Trump. So I'm just going to elide over the last 40 years. The strengths of the book are many, uh, but there might be, like I said, a few weaknesses for the general reader. First, like I said, the aforementioned lack of familiarity with the politics of Western Europe over the last two centuries might be a assembling block for some people. A second would be the occasional oversight, I think, on uh, Edmund Fawcett's part of what I would consider to be a major thinker or a major uh, idea, uh, two examples being Michael Oakeshott and uh, Raymond Aron. Oakeshott actually makes it into the text, but for some reason, uh, I'm not quite sure if he isn't listed in the subject index. Uh, Raymond Aron remains... Uh, I think pretty important to a history of 20th century conservatism at least, um, but is absent from the book despite his radical critique of many strains of uh, the French intellectual tradition uh, for being 
overtly and overly influenced by Marxism. His uh, 1955 book, The Opium of the Intellectuals, goes into this uh, in great detail. But I'm also aware that any book on such a broad swath of intellectual history, such as conservatism, writ large, must curate careful decisions about both omissions and commissions. And I myself often roll my eyes when I read reviews that exasperatedly claim, but, but, but X and Y and Z, where are X and Y and Z in this history? Or, you know, too much time was spent on, you know, P, Q, and R. Um, so, enough with the quibbles. Um, above, I use the word near encyclopedic to describe Fawcett's treatment of his subject. And I promise that list of names that I gave you, I rattled off earlier, that wasn't just to uh, satiate my insufferable garrulousness. It was to give some faint hint of the research and the excavation of ideas uh, that was obviously put into this book uh, by, by the author. Uh, you'll learn names, you'll learn ideas with which you were previously unfamiliar, almost certainly, <laughs> Uh, if there's even if there's only a few of them, uh, this book's overwhelming strong point, however, is its international approach. Uh, books on American conservatism are pretty easy to find, but ones that draw just as readily from European conservatives' traditions and do so even-handedly and fairly are pretty few and far between. And because of all of this and more, I think this book really deserves a place, a, a respected place on any bookshelf devoted to the history of political ideas. So I want to thank Peg one more time for uh, sending this book along to me. Uh, it was a very, very, very interesting and fun and highly informative read. Um, Conservatism, The Fight for a Tradition by Edmund Fawcett. And I will see everyone again next week. Bye.